Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to finish my mini-series on game theory with a look at the surreal numbers. In the last few videos, we looked at the numbers, a number system that fell out of playing impartial games. But as we'll see, if we look at a different kind of game, we'll discover an entirely separate number system known as the Surreals. Let's consider a game called Hackenbush. We have two players, blue and red, and a bush made out of colored edges. The players take turns cutting edges of their respective colors, so blue might cut this edge, and red might cut this one. And any edges like this one that get disconnected from the ground disappear as well. And the last player who can make a move wins. As always, our question is, who wins and how? Let's start simple. If there are no edges, then whoever goes first loses immediately since there's no legal move. That may be a little too simple, so. Let's say we have only blue edges. Then if red goes first, well, there's no legal move, so blue wins. And if blue goes first, then whatever move she makes, that leaves red with nothing. And so again, blue wins. In this game, blue has an insurmountable advantage. And similarly, if there were only red edges, red could guarantee the win. Okay, now what happens if both players have edges? If they have the same number, then whatever the first player does, the second player can mirror it, and repeating until we run out of edges, the second player wins. On the other hand, if one player has more, it doesn't really matter who goes first, the player with more edges wins. So having more edges is an advantage. We'll call the size of that advantage the value of the position. And to avoid having to say blue has an advantage of three or red has an advantage of four, we'll say the value of a position is positive if blue can guarantee the win and negative if red can, and zero if whoever goes first loses. So this position has a value of three, and this one has a value of negative four. And it's not too hard to see that swapping the colors negates the value, and playing two games at the same time adds their values together. What happens if the edges aren't so neatly separated? For instance, what if we have a position like this one where the edges are stacked? What value should we give this position? Well, if blue goes first, she'll cut this edge, leaving red with no legal moves. And if red goes first, he'll cut this edge, blue will cut this one, and red will be left with nothing. So, whoever goes first, blue wins. And as we just said, that means the value of this position is positive. On the other hand, if we add a red edge, that is, we subtract one from the value, now you can check that red can guarantee the win, and so this position must have value less than zero, which means x must be less than one. And since it's positive and less than one, a natural guess is that it has value one half. And sure enough, if we put two copies of this position together with one red edge, that is, we take the value 2x minus 1, you can check that whoever goes first loses, which means this position has value 0. And solving, that tells us that x has value 1 half. So this position is worth half an edge. How about a position like this? It's got one more red edge than the previous position, so it has to be at least a bit better for red, which means the value has to be less than one half. But it's still a win for blue by cutting this bottom edge, 
so it has to be more than zero. A natural guess is that it's halfway between them at one fourth. And sure enough, four copies of this position balance with one red edge to create a zero position, so one fourth is the right value. And if we add another red edge to the top and do the same balancing act, we get one eighth and then a sixteenth, a thirty second, and so on. And each red edge we add to the stack cuts blue's advantage in half. Okay, now what happens when we mix blue and red edges? Well, this should be more than one half, since there's more blue, but it should be less than one, since there's red on top. And so we might guess three fourths. And with a bit of care, we can show that four of these balance with three red edges, and so that is the right value. And we can keep going like this. As an exercise, see if you can find the values for all of these positions. And once you have those, see if you can spot the more general pattern for values of towers like these. So far, we've only looked at positions like this, where the edges are in a single stack. And even then, it's getting a bit tedious to find these values. We'd have to do a lot of trial and error to find that 32 copies of this position balance with 25 blue edges. We need a better way to evaluate these positions. To do that, let's introduce some new notation. We'll write a position as a pair of sets, in brackets, separated by a vertical bar. On the left, we'll write all the positions that blue can move to. So if blue cuts this top edge, we end up here, and if she cuts this bottom edge, we end up here. And on the right, we'll write all the positions that red can move to. And then we can repeat this process, expanding each of these out recursively until we get to positions at the bottom where there are no possible moves. How do we get values out of this? Well, we've evaluated some positions already, so let's see if we can use those to find a good rule. If both of our sets are empty, that corresponds to a game with no legal moves, which we know has value zero. If we have no values on the right, that means that red can't make any moves, or in other words, all of the edges are blue. And as we've seen, if all the edges are blue, the value is just the number of edges. And any move will reduce that number of edges by at least one, so the largest number in this set must be one less than the value. In other words, the value is the next whole number after everything on the left. And similarly, if there's nothing on the left, then the value must be the next smaller whole number below everything on the right. Okay, how about if we have numbers on both sides? Here, we know that removing this blue edge will leave us with nothing, which gives us a zero, and removing this red edge will leave us with one blue edge, which gives us a one. And we know the value of this, it's one half, which we'll notice is between zero and one. So the value of the position should be somewhere between everything on the left and everything on the right. And every value we've seen for every position so far has a denominator with a power of two, so we'll choose the fraction with the smallest power of two that's between everything on the left and everything on the right. This new notation actually gives us a way to define numbers from the ground up. We'll start with two empty sets, which we'll call zero. That's the simplest number. And then we define one to have zero on the left, and negative one to have zero on the right. Those are the next simplest numbers. And from there, we take all partitions of negative one, zero, and one, where everything on the left is less than everything on the right. And the ones on the ends are just counting down and up, respectively, and the ones in the middle are going to be halfway between their two neighbors. 
And then we repeat this process. We take all of the numbers from these first three rows and partition them in every possible way where the left set is less than the right, and that'll give us the numbers in this fourth row. And if we repeat this for long enough, we'll end up with every possible binary fraction. So what we're doing is splitting numbers into two sets where one set is less than the other. If you've studied analysis, that may sound familiar. It's a Dedekind cut. That's how we define the real numbers using the rationals. But it turns out we don't need all the rationals to do that. The binary fractions are enough. So we can define all the real numbers in this way. For instance, using these two bounding sequences, we can define one third. But with this definition, we're not limited to the reals. After all, we can use any two sets we like, so long as the left is less than the right. So what happens if we put all the whole numbers on the left? Well, it's a perfectly valid Hackenbush position, corresponding to an infinite stack of blue edges. But what's its value? It has to be more than 0, more than 1, 2, 3, and so on. It has to be bigger than every real number. So we'll give it a new name, omega. And omega is a number outside the set of reals. But it is still a number, so we can do arithmetic with it. We can add, subtract, multiply, take powers. We can also divide. Omega is greater than 1, 2, 3, and so on, so 1 over omega must be less than 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so on. And omega is positive, so 1 over omega should also be positive. And so this number, which gets its own name epsilon, is going to be less than this sequence of fractions, which makes it less than every positive real. And it turns out that this is the value for a stack like this with one blue edge underneath infinitely many red edges. And the collection of numbers that we can create this way, including omega, epsilon, and every combination, is known as the surreal numbers. We can more rigorously define our arithmetic operations using our set notation. They're each defined recursively in terms of the simpler numbers that make up x and y. And with a bit of induction, we can show that everything works out consistently and it matches our expectation for the real numbers. And with these operations, the surreal numbers form a field. And there's a natural order to them, too. We can either use the set notation or say that one number is larger than another if the corresponding game gives more of an advantage to blue. So the surreals form an ordered field. And more than that, they form what's known as a universal ordered field. That is, every other ordered field whether that's the reals, the rational functions, hyperreals, whatever, all of them are contained within the surreals. So just by playing games, we've stumbled across the biggest possible ordered field of numbers. Except that's not the end of the story. We still have one important restriction, that the left set is smaller than the right. What happens if we take that away? For instance, if we introduce green edges into Hackenbush, which both players can cut, then there are positions like this one where the players have the same moves available. In our notation, the left and right sets are equal. And if the players have the same moves, then we're playing an impartial game. As we've seen in the last few videos, that gives us the nimbers, which we write with stars to avoid ambiguity. Or we could mix edges together, 
which can give us positions that are neither surreal numbers nor numbers. Or we might have a game where the left set is larger than the right. For instance, if we add the rule that we can't disconnect edges from the ground, then this position has value 1, negative 1. And this lets us talk about what's known as the temperature of games, which is useful for analyzing positions with isolated pockets of action, like endgames in Go. And we're only scratching the surface here. If you found these ideas interesting and really want to dive into combinatorial game theory, I highly recommend these books, On Numbers and Games and Winning Ways for Your Mathematical Plays. With that, we've reached the end of the series. I'd like to thank you so much for all the support and feedback along the way. If you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.